uh, Martin Hamilton uh, from JISC. Martin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I, I don't know how to follow an intro like that. So, hello, I'm Martin. Um, I wonder if anybody recognises this picture. This is a picture we have on the wall uh, in the coffee room back at the office. So, does any, anyone recognise this? So, this is uh, a famous movie star. Penny Lamar, that's right. Does anybody know why Penny Lamar is famous apart from being a film star? Oh, you're way ahead of me. I was, that was going to be my big opener. So, yeah, so Hedy Lamar, in addition to being a famous uh, actress and film star, invented the, the technology that underpins Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And actually, she did that uh, to fight the Nazis. So, you know, we, we often think about, you know, that there, in, in our world right now, there are some quite um, troubling things stir up, there's some quite worrying movements afoot. Here's somebody who said, right, do you know what? I've got everything I could ever want. I'm living a comfortable life, I'm rich. I'm going to do something about that. And, and she was a Jewish refugee living in America. So but it's actually quite a profound story if you, if you ever uh, get curious and want to look it up. It's all on Wikipedia. Um, so, what am I going to talk about today? I, I wanted to just have a quick canter through uh, three things. So the first thing is take a little bit of a look at kind of future trends, <coughs> and particularly at sort of near future industries, the stuff that's just around the corner. Um, I wanted to have a little bit of a think there about what, when we talk about digital literacy, uh, we talk about information literacy and this sort of thing. We have, have a quite a particular idea, I find, on the whole about what those things mean. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and uh, nudge you out of your comfort zone when we talk about digital literacy uh, quite a bit. Actually. I'm going to try and nudge you, shove you out of your comfort zone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, that peril. You know, we, it, it, we shouldn't be having to talk about fighting Nazis in 2018, but the truth is we, we are. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the threats that we face as a society, the threats that progressive values face. And because that would be a bit kind of gloomy and just at the beginning of what will be a super event, uh, I'm going to try and lift the mood a little bit after that and look at the boundless potential of what we're calling the fourth industrial revolution of technologies. So without further ado, let's talk about the, the promise. So that fourth industrial revolution, you, you'll hear this um, said a lot by people um, right now that the phase of connectivity, the miniaturization of computing, the fact that we can pretty much put a chip in anything now. We buy a, a toothbrush with a chip in it, but yes, it uses Bluetooth to talk to your phone. It'll tell you if you're brushing your teeth properly. You know, there are uh, universities and colleges that we work with at JISC who are looking at putting a sensor into every chair in the room so they can understand the patterns of use and occupancy environmental monitoring, things like this. Is this room too bright, too dark? Uh, after we've been in here for a while, the CO2 builds up because it falls to the ground. When there's too much CO2, you start to get a headache, and you fall asleep. All of these things are possible because the technologies have become commoditized, miniaturized, pervasive. So what that really leads to is an opportunity for us to say, actually, uh, we're preparing our learners for this workplace of the future, the, the world of the future that they will be going into. Um, but actually, it's an opportunity also for us to transform the way that we approach not just teaching learning, but also our institutions. I know we're predominantly a schools audience here, but just we uh, connect about half the schools in the country to the internet. And we also do a lot of work with colleges and universities. So we're very interested in, in how this will play out. Uh, is it all about robots? Uh, you know, are the robots coming to take our jobs? Well, actually, there's a wonderful line from Gartner. Gartner said, I don't, don't, don't believe a word of it. The robots are here to give you a promotion. The robots are here to take away the drudgery and the boredom of mindless, repetitive tasks that we all find ourselves doing every day. Um, what, what could those near future careers be that these technologies I'm talking about will? open doors to. Uh, these are all things you can do right now. 
So I'm being a little bit cheeky here when I say near future. Uh, there really is a company recruiting right now for asteroid miners, believe it or not. So if you go to planetaryresources.com, uh, if, if you can see a career change, <laughs> uh, there is a little apply now button, and you can say, OK, I'll come. I fancy a crack at this. The truth is, they're not going to strap you to a rocket and shoot you up into space just yet. They're looking for people who can build robots that can be shot up into space to mine asteroids. Why would you want to do that? Because it takes a heck of a lot of effort to get stuff off planet Earth. But if you can take advantage of resources that are in space, you can do an awful lot of stuff. But these are real jobs. So DNA editing, for instance, if you go into uh, Indeed or LinkedIn jobs or something like that, if you search for some of the DNA editing technologies, Cas9, CRISPR, you'll see that there are loads and loads of jobs, and not just in university research labs. DNA editing is becoming a viable career option. And I find that really fascinating. You know, I, when I talk to somebody from a college or a university, the, the expectation is that the students they've got will go into a career which they aren't necessarily positioned for, they aren't necessarily prepared for, um, because these new f near future industries are zooming ahead. They're, they're coming at such a fast rate of knots. And I think this kind of percolates all the way through down the school system as well. How do we prepare people for these things when the pace of change has become so fast? And robot wrangling is definitely here today. And we've already heard from, from one speaker about getting, getting the robots <laughs> into school. There's an awful lot of that. But the robots you use in school to demonstrate some basic concepts, big leap forward and you get onto your humanoid robots that you can talk to and hold a conversation with. Um, I talked about space. I think this is a really fascinating example of one of these near future industries, which is actually starting to happen now. It's, it's really coming together, principally because of a company called SpaceX. And SpaceX, if you're not familiar with them, what they've done is make a rocket that you can fly up into space, land, and use again. So historically, you make this rocket, it costs you $100 million. You fly it up into space, boom, and you throw it away. So you know, the, the hardware itself, maybe $60 million, the earth stations, the controls, and all the rest of it, fuel, cost a heck of a lot of money, and you throw it away. What they've done is they've figured out how to reuse it, how to build a rocket you can fly again and again. And that means that in our lifetime, it will become common for people to live and work off planet. And so far, there's only been, I think it's about 350 people through um, Skylab, through the International Space Station, through NEAR, we've had that experience. In our lifetimes, there will be substantial numbers of people who don't live on Earth anymore. And that, that seems like science fiction, right? But this is really going to happen. And this is, this is the, the pivotal moment when it all came together. Actually, in the UK, this is quite a big deal for us. We make an awful lot of these things. We make nearly half of the uh, small kind of this this size satellites in the world. So space is already a quite a big industry for us in the UK. We don't necessarily all realise how big it is. This one's my favourite though. This is from a company in Glasgow, and its job is to scoop up all of the random rubbish that's floating around in space because people have just been shooting things up for you know fifty odd years. So it fires around a great big net to catch all of the random debris floating around in space, and then it deorbits and burns up and removes the rubbish. So isn't that fascinating? It's sort of space food, though. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to see, in the very near future, um, things like virgin space tourism. So picture Richard Branson, uh, one of our old theme bomber, Cold War airfields, maybe nuclear airport in Cornwall. Um, he's got this rocket that sits under what's effectively two planes sandwiched together. They fly this thing up to uh, quite, quite a high altitude. They let the rocket go. The rocket, it really is a rocket. This is a huge, great rocket engine here. will fly people up to the edge of space for tourism. So think about that picture. Probably in the next 12 months, Richard Branson at Newquay Airport with a surfboard big toothy grin, and you know, I'm, I'm here for a bit of surfing, off on a little space jaunt, 
it feels like science fiction. This is the real thing, actually, flying. If you search for uh, Virgin Galactic, you'll find some incredible videos of their test flights. So my point here is there are a lot of these things that we will talk about, near future careers, near future industries, and it feels like science fiction. It feels like, well, you know, one day, one day maybe. But everything I've shown you already exists. And that's the world that the kids who are going through our schools today, the students at our colleges and universities are going into. So this, this is here today. But something else that's here today is a little bit more worrying. And I thought I'd, I'd kind of lower the mood a bit with the most worrying thing of all. So climate change. Anybody know what this is? You can probably figure it out. Uh, you won't be able to read the small print. So this is, this is the uh, Larsen ice shelf in Antarctica over a roughly 10 year period. And this line here is the crack that developed over that period. Before that entire ice shelf, which is the size of Luxembourg, broke off and floated off to melt. So that's actually watching. This is from obviously Earth observation satellites. We're actually watching climate change happening here. This isn't a, a hypothetical. Another example of climate change actually happening is the shrinking of the um, Arctic um, ice cap. So ordinarily, in the past, pretty much the whole of the Arctic would have been frozen over. And if you can focus on this little bit down here, this is the far north of Canada. So historically, far north of Canada, frozen wilderness, yeah, no, nothing, maybe a few polar bears, maybe that's it. Now, it's, it's a place you can go on a cruise. So this is a cruise ship called Crystal Serenity. And with the opening of the Northwest Passage for climate change, it suddenly has become possible to take a couple of thousand people on a pleasure cruise through, like I said, what would have been solid ice. So this thing, they're, they're confident enough they're not going to crash this and lose all passengers in some kind of Titanic type incident. But they will run a cruise liner through the Northwest Passage, which would have been solid ice. So if you ever want an example or two of, of climate change, that's really happening. You know, we, we might say, oh, the summer was a bit hotter than usual this year. And, you know, the, the autumn's been quite mild. If you're a polar bear, it's pretty life or death, actually. It's, it's survival. But this, I think, is a, is a wonderful symbol for us. We say, look, you know, climate change has, has made such a difference that we can now run a pleasure cruise in what would have been a, a harsh, Arctic wilderness. There's other sorts of peril though, and these are much more relevant to our conversations today. Um, I call this side weaponized opinions, but basically the number of people, the number of entities out there that are trying to uh, twist or sway our thinking, steer us down a particular path. We obviously heard a lot recently about um, Facebook, about Cambridge Analytica, uh, EU referendum campaign. But the truth is, it's just out there everywhere. It's everywhere from advertisers, political campaigns, actually some quite extreme groups. Um, well, what can we do about that? And I think we come back to the folk sat here in this room. Um, when we have kids coming through our schools, students through our colleges and universities, We've got the opportunity to give those guys some real information literacy skills. When we talk about digital literacy, we often talk about learning to block. Let's get to grips with social media. Um, you know, quite, quite fundamental stuff. It's really useful. But this ambiguation, is, is this someone who's trying to steer me or influence me? Absolutely crucial, in my opinion. And actually, it's not just a um, case of you know, advertisers and political campaigns. We also have nation states, the so-called advanced persistent threats. So when a nation state sets up a, a hacking team whose job is to uh, buy up a few million dollars worth of online adverts to sow discord in a society, you know, that, that's something we, we have to have a societal level response to that. Um, let's say, 
we, we train some AIs, we train some AIs to do particular tasks for us. AIs aren't really very intelligent. AI is probably a bit of a misnomer. And there's this wonderful thing called a paperclip maximizer. It's an example of what could happen if an AI goes wrong. And if you Google paperclip maximizer, the, the conceit is we make an AI whose job is to create paperclips. The AI you know, uses all the raw materials available to it and it looks around. Well, okay, my job is to make paperclips, and to make as many paperclips as I can, but they're going to be the best paperclips, and it starts melting things down to make ever more paperclips. <coughs> it's a fascinating example of what AI could do if it went to a war. <coughs> If somebody deliberately engineered it to do something that dare I say was a little bit evil. And it, the truth is, we're in quite a dark place right now. Um, the idea that the Prime Minister of, of Hungary, Victor Orban, can actually say, hey, you know, finally the era of liberal democracy is over. Progressive values, poof, we, we don't want to hear any more about that. Um, the fact that we're, we're seeing political movements across the world who are excited, enthusiastic, ecstatic even about dismantling a lot of what we take for granted in our society right now. Equality, diversity, those are those are problems for them, those are things that they want to eradicate, you know, to cleanse their society of these others <coughs> that they disapprove of. This is not a good place to be, and I think there's a very real question for us in education about how we interact with that kind of agenda. How do we be the guardians of progressive values when sometimes our own governments are trying to dismantle them? So this is a very profound thing. But that's a bit of a downer, and <laughs> I want to have a little movement. So um, going back to space, because space, I think, is, is endlessly fascinating. There are so many things we've never done. So we think about the, the kids who are at school now, the kids who are going to college and university in the next five, ten years. What are they going to be learning? What are they learning about things like this? How, how does how does the internet work when we go on the planet? How do we grow enough food to feed a colony on Mars? These are going to be real questions. And they're super exciting. And you can actually start to and I think this is probably quite a good one to engage kids with at school. You can start to say, well, let's imagine how that would be. You know, we did the Romans last week. Okay. <coughs> the Romans are great, but, you know, let's, let's do something that really captivates people's imagination. Maybe some of these questions, you know, right now the space station, each zone of the International Space Station is governed by the law of the country that sent the module up. How's it going to work when there are millions of people in space? So lots of these questions. And new technologies as well. This is an optical wafer developed at the University of Southampton that stores vast amounts of data sent up on, on the tip of Elon Musk's space car to Mars. This is a real thing that really happened. How do we start to embed some of these things in our teaching and learning? So lots of, lots of questions, lots of interesting ideas, hopefully. And I'll leave you with one thought. I think I, I love this uh, picture by Simon Stalenhardt very kindly gave me permission to use it. Um, let's imagine that schools, particularly schools, are a kind of portal onto uh, a world of not just numeracy and literacy, a world of ideas as well. Let's really make the most of that. Let's do everything we can with it. And that's been me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.